Well, good evening and welcome to Regent College and to our ninth evening public lecture of summer 2020. My name is Diane Stinton and I'm the Associate Professor of Mission Studies and World Christianity at Regent College, as well as the Dean of Students. So on behalf of the Regent community, I want to welcome you to Vancouver on this beautiful uh, summer evening here. And now it's my real privilege and joy to be able to introduce our speaker tonight and the title of her lecture. Susan Phillips has served as the Executive Director at New College Berkeley since 1994. And prior to this role, she was the academic dean. Dr. Phillips is keenly interested in how we live out our faith in daily life, drawing insight from the diverse fields of the social sciences, biblical spirituality, and practical theology. She's a sociologist and meets regularly with individuals for spiritual direction. She teaches in a wide range of contexts, serves as supervisor for spiritual directors, and consults for Christian organizations. In addition to being a regular contributor to summer classes at Regent College, she teaches at the Graduate Theological Union, Fuller's Theological Seminary in Northern California, and San Francisco Theological Seminary, Diploma in the Art of Spiritual Direction. Dr. Phillips sat on the Board of Governors at Regent College for eight years. I had the joy of working with her on the uh, Student Relations Committee, which she chaired so ably. Um, and she's also served on the editorial boards of Radix, Presence, and Reflective Practice. Her most recent book is The Cultivated Life, From Ceaseless Striving to Receiving Joy. With her husband, Steve, she worships at First Presbyterian Church of Berkeley and has served there as an elder. This evening, Dr. Phillips' lecture is entitled, Talking Our Walk, Cultivating Sacred Consciousness. So with that, I'll hand it over to you, Dr. Phillips. Thanks so much, Diane. What a treat to be here with you and uh, with all of you. Wherever you are, I wish I could see you. I wish we were together under the green roof. That is such a privilege to be here, even remotely, and to ponder um, things that matter, things that are constant in terms of what matters, even in these inconstant times. And I I, like you, I'm sure, have heard from many people who are really struggling very hard during this pandemic season, struggling to say grounded, centered, hopeful. The very real losses, anticipated losses, and ongoing experiences of threat and injustice are destabilizing many people. I keep hearing words like adrift, unmoored. People are speaking these words of dislocation about their identities, their experience of community, and sometimes their connection with God. As a spiritual director, I get to hear people speak quite frankly about that. I hear them open their hearts and their minds to God. And recently, a person I listened to, a longtime Christian, a person many people turn to for um, counsel when they struggle, said that during the pandemic season, he, I'll call him Jonathan, has felt more distant from God than he has in a long time, sometimes so profoundly so that he feels panicky almost as though he's drowning. As I listened to Jonathan speak about this, I saw him come to a sense of his experience before God, because that's what spiritual direction brings to mind, is that we are living and speaking in this context of God's grace. As he told his story over the course of the hour, he told me that he was once again 
finding his spiritual footing. This happened just through talking about his life and doing so with a consciousness of God. And I and others I know have found a similar kind of grounding, regrounding experience happens when we're well listened to in the context of a spiritual awareness of God. So the current crisis of COVID-19, it, it rattles us. It can shake us and destabilize us. It destabilizes patterns of work, worship, socializing. Some of the staples of our identity feel more circus-like than usual, involving hours of performing and spectating as we're doing now. Even our anchoring spiritual practices can lose definition when every day feels like Tuesday, or as someone said, every day is blurs day. The demarcation between weekdays and Sabbath dissolves. When we don't have to dress and drive for work, morning prayer practices can melt into the rest of the day or even be forgotten. When the ordinary structures of our lives and the connections of our days weaken, so do our identities and our stories. And this is not uncommon in a pandemic. I've been reading about the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1918 to 1920, sometimes called the Spanish flu. And one thing I've learned is that pandemics suffer from narrative depletion. One person writing about that pandemic 100 years ago, Laura Spinney, wrote that throughout human history, the story of each plague is remembered personally, not collectively, not as a historical disaster, but as millions of discrete private tragedies. Today in our own pandemic, reporters and scientists are finding that people's memories are challenged. We can't remember the day or what happened on a particular day. So it's a, it's a phenomenon that's happening to each of us and it's also happening collectively, this disruption of our narrative. Jonathan made a story out of his confusion, out of drowning and then finding his footing again. He felt re-anchored. And that's a process that we're going to go through repeatedly during this time of discovering that we're feeling a bit adrift and then finding ways of re-anchoring ourselves in God in our own lives. I think about what Paul said to the people of Athens. The one whom you worship without knowing is the one who created all people so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. Even as COVID-19 infects the globe, the world is enveloped by God. We live and move and have our being in God, even as we grope. Part of how we grope for and even sometimes find that all surrounding God is through telling and hearing stories of faith. God gives us spiritual stories in scripture and through people who have lived lives of faith throughout history. And we weave our own stories of faith. We were in the pandemic as we went through the season of Lent and through Holy Week with Jesus. And then the weeks following Jesus's resurrection with the disciples, their own tumultuous time, which must have felt at times 
like they weren't sure what was happening. Maybe they felt adrift. It was helpful, I think, for us as Christians to have those biblical stories, that history, overlap with our own pandemic so we could draw strength and companionship from those people who preceded us. We now are in a time unlike any time in most of our lifetimes when there is a worldwide fear of disease, lives being lost, the economy of the world has ground to a halt, and we have become increasingly awake to the way in which racism continues to afflict our world. And we trust that all of this takes place within the sphere of God. And in that, we each seek our own story. Story is formed when we pause and reflect on our experience. It's best done with a listener present, be that listener, the God to whom we pray, a person to whom we speak, and or the imagined reader to whom we write. My listening presence helped Jonathan's story coalesce, just as my spiritual director's listening presence helps my story coalesce. Attending through our lives through spiritual storytelling helps us notice when we've encountered divinity in the ordinary. We remember the people on the Emmaus Road. Jesus came upon them and helped them tell their story before he told his story. They stopped, they reflected, they spoke, and they listened. And then later, they told their story to their friends. This was formational and transformational, the way they talked their walk. So tonight, I'm really happy to be with you, reflecting on how we can talk our walks, too, with God, with one another, and thus cultivate sacred consciousness, our moment by moment awareness of the holy in the ordinary. As we discover and create our stories, we ask questions. Questions help us form our narrative. So I'm going to go through some of those questions now. There are what questions. Some orienting questions are what questions. What are the circumstances? What's my place in these circumstances? And many of us over the past few months have asked or have heard someone ask, what's God got to do with it? That question was tossed to me a number of months ago and it's reverberated in my mind. Some people ask it assuming that God is here. God is doing something in the midst of that, of this pandemic. In a Pew Research Center survey in March found that more than half of all Americans had prayed to end the spread of the coronavirus. These people trust that God's involved. They hope that God's got something to do with it. Yet we hear other people asking that question, what's God got to do with it, with a shrug. And so it's obvious that God's got nothing to do with this. The throwaway question signals despair, sometimes anger, perhaps a deep once held hope grown bitter from disappointment. In reading about the influenza pandemic 100 years ago, compounded crisis that overlapped with World War I, the Great War. I learned that religious participation, religious participation in Europe began to decline at about that time. Perhaps some people asked what's God got to do with it and decided not much. The what questions are epistemological. We are interested in what distinguishes justified belief 
from opinion? Those are often the first questions we ask. We also ask how questions, practical, moral questions. How shall we respond given the circumstances, given our faith? How do we follow Jesus in this pandemic, in this quarantine time? How can we be helpful? The tragic killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis on May 25th galvanized active responses. People marched, spoke, sang, wept, gathered together and demanded justice and continue to do so. The pandemic in general, for most people, has not offered such active responses to the how questions. Yet people of faith in both circumstances ask, teach us how to pray, Lord. In March, as the pandemic began, the number of Google searches for prayer skyrocketed across 95 countries. People were asking how to pray. People did so a hundred years ago too. Newspaper stories from that time about churches in the United States tell of temporary church closures to prevent contagion, some outdoor services, and also some tales of charity where people and churches gave clothing and food to epidemic orphans. They, one article said that the churches gave applesauce, lamb stew, and Johnny cake. These responses are not unlike the responses we ourselves are making today. A hundred years ago, some pastors wrote about being called upon for extra pastoral care. Some, some priests and pastors were uh, disciplined by local authorities for continuing to assemble for worship when it wasn't considered safe. Families found ways to worship in their homes. People were asking how questions, how to walk their talk as Christians in the midst of the epidemic. People also ask why questions seeking meaning. We seek meaning from science, from theology, from social science. Sometimes there are why questions though that howl and distract. Thinly veiled attempts to allocate blame and magically gain some control. Perhaps someone is being punished through this this catastrophe. Perhaps I can figure out the formula to accept myself and my loved ones from that punishment. Even for people with careful biblical theologies, these theodicies that allocate blame to why questions arise in times of profound suffering and pain. In 1918, some pastors preached that the epidemic was the fault of Christian churches for being, quote, lamentably weak in moral and spiritual leadership. We read even earlier in the 14th century that some pastors, priests, uh, said that the plague was due to God's wrath. Not too long ago during the HIV crisis of the 1980s and 90s, and then again in this century during devastations by natural disasters, Christians were heard blaming the afflicted for their suffering. For instance, New Orleans was a sinful city, so God sent Hurricane Katrina as a punishment, said one pastor on the radio. If such theodicies that tend to blame the victims are being circulated today during the pandemic. I haven't seen much of that. And then the last kind of question is the who questions 
pandemics, as I said, drain, drain our narratives. They also drain our sense of narrative agency, our ability to construct narratives. People seek heroes and victories, which wars provide. The virtues for most of us that the pandemic calls for are quiet ones. Patience, obedience, perseverance, prudence, restraint, hope. Sheltering in place isn't the activity of a superhero. Very few books, plays, and other works of art were created focusing on that influenza pandemic 100 years ago. It was eclipsed by the war. The war provided stories of heroes. Even just last year, the film called 1917 was released about that war. Yet the pandemic of the last century, occurring as it did before the discovery of antibiotics, left approximately 675,000 Americans dead and more than 50 million people died worldwide. More than died in either of the great world wars. The world's largest library catalog lists around 80,000 80, books on the First World War in more than 40 languages and around only 400 on the Spanish flu. Today in our own pandemic, we try to identify some heroes, healthcare workers, some volunteers, but we struggle to construct significant narratives of our own lives. Also a hundred years ago, people desired to gather together in prayer. That is a significant who. God is the who towards whom people of faith want to turn. In a in hundred years ago, people couldn't gather together to pray for the soldiers lost in the war. I've been to two online memorial services during this time, unable to gather face to face and grieve the loss of our beloved. A pastor in Washington, D.C. a hundred years ago protested the ban on church gatherings, writing in an op-ed in the newspaper that prayer had any efficacy in the physical world was an idea that was given no hospitality at that time. How do we today offer hospitality to prayer? to the idea of prayer's efficacy. How do we expand that reach of hospitality? In the reports from 100 years ago, there is that desire for prayer and a longing for story. And I believe prayer and story go hand in hand. Spinney writing about that influenza epidemic wrote that memory, and I would say story formation, is an active process. Details have to be rehearsed to be retained, but who wants to rehearse the details of a pandemic? A war has a victor, but a pandemic has only vanquished. A belief in a God who cares transforms the storyline from one of hopeless passivity to one of hopeful transformation. Even in suffering, indeed, even in death, we don't have to be heroes. We are God's beloved. Our prayer is relational. It's not transactional. We open our hearts to God knowing that our suffering may continue. And in doing so, our spiritual narratives continue to be woven. Prayer has efficacy. So I want to turn now 
and reflect a little bit on the theological landscape in which we find ourselves. A century ago, when we experienced the flu epidemic, churches were far more central to civic life, at least in North America. Clergy often had roles as public intellectuals in conversations about governance and the common good. The culture extended hospitality to prayer in churches and in the public square. For a long period of time, through much of the 19th century and a little beyond, Christians were, as it were, in the room where it happens, introducing prayer into those rooms of governance. That's changed over time, especially in North America among younger people today. There has been a decline in that view of the significance of prayer and its efficacy and its place. So I wonder how faith is represented in today's crisis, such that it offers meaning and hope for the stories of our lives. Researchers associated with the Fetzer Institute found recently that in the US today, religion-like communities are flourishing. And they use examples like CrossFit. Giving young adults the experience of meaning and belonging that we've traditionally associated with religious communities. These secular communities offer a form of spirituality by helping people grope toward something more. That's how they title their report. That's what people say they're looking for, something more. And when I read that term, something more, I always think of Paul speaking to the Athenians, the one we seek and grope toward, in whom we live and move and have our being. They, the Fetzer researchers, describe the something more we thirst for as the profound, the transcendent, or even God, that which forms the ground of our being. And they found among these young people they surveyed that coupled with the thirst for something more is an acute yearning for soulful community. The sad finding was that researchers found this uh, help in reaching the something more and cultivating soulful community more alive and well for the millennial generation in secular religious-like communities, religion-like communities, than in actual religious organizations. They said that many religious organizations lack crucial patterns of spiritual cultivation. And they identified three of these patterns upholding accountability, guiding purpose finding, and unleashing creativity. So these secular communities were better at doing that, at accountability, purpose finding, and creativity than were the religious organizations. These patterns foster personal formation and social transformation, and young adults are seeking it. Writing in 2016 about this, our cultural landscape and the place of theological education within it, Daniel Elsher, who then was the president of the Association of Theological Schools, which oversees theological education in North America, including at Regent, wrote that theological schools and churches and Christians in general increasingly live in a cultural, uh, in a culture that deprivileges religion. We live in a culture that deprivileges religion. And he thought it would continue to do that more and more. And reading his words, and wondering about how we are privileging religion, giving hospitality to prayer and worship in our pandemic, 
uh, I think I think that's a very important question. How are we doing it? I believe Regent does it well. And this afternoon had the joy of meeting with people spread around the world who gathered together for prayer and spiritual reflection, learning, and learning better how to listen to God and one another and to our own selves as we weave our narratives. This is a narrative spirituality, a core part, I believe, of a formational role of religion in our culture. How do we help people discover and become who they are to be? Narrative spirituality is part of that. So those of you who've come to my lectures before will not be surprised that in thinking about these things, I find pilgrimage imagery instructive and fruitful and timely. Ancient literature shows us people on pilgrimage as they recovered from pandemics, walking through the day, gathering with uh, fellow pilgrims, in the evening to tell stories. Two classics in the Western canon, Boccaccio's Decameron and Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, both wrote, written in the fourth, 14th century, following wars and also following the Black Death, which took the lives of 30 to 60% of all the people in, living in Europe. These authors wrote these books um, in which people were on pilgrimage and told their stories to one another in the evenings. Each book is historically being significant for being written in the language the people actually spoke rather than in some arcane academic language. So they wanted their books to be accessible. In both books, people undertook this communal adventure and told stories to each other. They were traveling with people who were not their kith, their friends, nor their kin, their family. So 14th century plague wisdom is engage in pilgrimage and in that storytelling and story listening. So what, what might that look like for us today? As persons and communities uh, of faith, we pray, we tell our stories, and we form communitas, this uh, gathering of people who are brought together with a similar purpose and hope, but who are not necessarily part of the same uh, daily community with one another. We need to walk our talk. We need to live morally, answer those how questions. But we must also talk our walk for the sake of identity, of mission, personal formation, and social transformation. Sometimes the storytelling and listening take place on the path as two people fall and step together like Dante and Virgil did in the Divine Comedy. Sometimes the stories form around a table or in a garden, as with Chaucer and Boccaccio. Often they're told around a flickering light of candles, a hearth, or a campfire. And we can take metaphorical pilgrimages, even in this pandemic, even sheltered in place. And I want to tell you an example. For five years, I led the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, and we'll begin again to do it in the fall on Zoom. <laughs> and since then, since that group five or six years ago, that first group met, those people chose to become a spiritual direction group meeting monthly. So we meet. It's a time of storytelling among people that are neither our 
friends, our family, or our fellow congregants in churches. We pray together. We have followed the life of Jesus together. We read scripture together. And each person tells his or her story and is truly listened to. We've gone through all kinds of spiritual terrain and weather. We met when one person's father was approaching death and then died. We went through that season. We've gone through many seasons with a person loving a child through all kinds of seasons. We accompanied a person who was approaching retirement and now has entered that new uh, terrain of retirement. We've prayed with another person leaving one ministry and developing another. People open their hearts. They rely on each other as spiritual friends. They can say what is true about their experience of God. And partly they can do it because there is confidentiality in the group. One man discovered in our work together that he really wasn't sure he had a personal relationship with Jesus, despite being a churchgoer and Bible reader for years. And over time, praying the gospel stories, that has been cultivated. And with great joy, we have witnessed that. In terms of what the Fetzer researchers found churches lack, this group has it. We uphold accountability. We help others find purpose as we do so ourselves. And being together unleashes creativity. We offer hospitality to the idea that prayer has efficacy. We grow in our spiritual consciousness, in our awareness of God, and we talk our walk. And the pandemic, I believe, and I've been hearing others say, is a golden opportunity for just this kind of gathering in small groups, granted virtually or physically distanced in the same space. Church may be more and more like this with extended opportunities for storytelling and listening. So that may be a silver lining in the dark cloud of our time. Thinking in pilgrimage Im imagery is in keeping with the turn toward a narrative approach to social phenomenon, which gained prominence 50 years ago and has bloomed across academic fields, across philosophy um, and theology. It has uh, affected the way professional schools train people. More case studies are used. And it's also resonant with a slightly more recent topographical turn towards understanding the present time in theory as the epic of space much more spatial imagery is being used. So without getting into the philosophical weeds of these trends, I think we can benefit from the scholarly move to understand theory as embodied, storied travel. Embodied, storied travel. And this view draws on the translation of the Greek term theorene, from which we get our word theory, as the practice of travel and observation. Travel for the sake of observation, having one's story shaped, and then bringing back those observations to your home community. That's what we see in scripture time and again. It's what we see and experience on pilgrimage. For example, Mary going to the tomb uh, in John 20. She, she peers in the tomb and she sees angels 
And the text says that she saw, she looked, and the word is theoreo. She was beginning to form an idea of what was happening, completely mysterious and unprecedented, right? That's a popular word today too. And so she has this embodied, storied travel that shapes her and she brings that story back to the disciples. It's what metaphorical pilgrims do too. Like geographical pilgrims, there's a separation, usually a communitas, some kind of pilgrim community, discipline for the sake of the formation of the whole, and then returning with the story to the home community. There's a kind of flow of God's grace in that. And that's what apparently religion-like communities are seeking. They are seeking that kind of spiritual transformation of themselves and of themselves in community. Now they're doing it without the benefit of knowing the who that gave us the, the word spiritual. In the New Testament, we read about Christians as pilgrims. We were strangers and pilgrims, <coughs> excuse me, on the earth, we read in Hebrews 11 and 1 Peter 2. And they were also in a world that deprivileged their religion, as Alsher says we're in. Today, more and more people are seeking pilgrimage, geographical pilgrimage. They are hoping to cultivate sacred consciousness as they step out of their normal lives and onto well-traveled pilgrim trails. Millions of people over the past decade have gone out on these pilgrim trails. I, one of them. And I think this is part of this thirst for something more and for soulful community. For pilgrimage is formational. Now, I have heard pilgrimage pilgrimage language used about a variety of situations. Some people describe their journey with cancer as a pilgrimage. Life in a pandemic can be a pilgrimage. We can live it that way. If it includes an intention for and hope of formation. If it includes listening for the who, who is with us in the midst of this, of allowing our narratives to be shaped and formed, even in ways that might be startling for us, and to allow ourselves to participate with a community of fellow pilgrims, however virtual their proximity. For it to be a pilgrimage of faith, Prayer, too, is essential. For we weave our stories in the context of God's story. Alistair McIntyre famously said at the end of After Virtue that a person can only answer the question, what am I to do, if I can answer the prior question of what story or stories do I find myself apart. So we can only really walk our talk, he's saying, if we're able to talk our walk. Those two are inter interdependent. So how do we do this? There is an area in academic studies and professional circles, particularly in the training of helping professionals, that's called reflective practice. Helping professionals need regular times 
of quiet reflection on their practices, as well as times of peer conversation to pay attention to their caring work. Many helping professionals, physicians, teachers, nurses, therapists, pastors, do their work away from the view of other peers. They are solitary practitioners. They need strategies for reflective practice. I have been in a spiritual direction peer supervision group where we are able in that confidential setting to reflect on our practice. We are a communitas. We're not necessarily friends. We're not family. We are people of faith. We are people on this particular journey of being spiritual directors. And we can get the reflective distance necessary to tell our story, to hear it as we tell it, and then to hear others reflect on it. Years ago, I edited a book about uh, the helping professions and various helping professionals wrote chapters for it. Eugene Peterson, uh, of blessed memory in the world and in the Regent community, wrote a beautiful chapter on the caring practice of pastoring and on prayer. And a teacher of teachers, Anna Rickard, wrote this about the reflective practice in teaching. Reflective teaching assumes that central to good teaching is a rigorously thoughtful examination of the purposes and consequences of what teachers do. The actual reflective process occurs frequently in teaching and refers to those times when action is stopped even temporarily, and the teacher, either alone or with others, attempts to make sense of what has occurred, what is occurring, what will occur. This is what happens with people time and time again with Jesus. This is what happened with those people on the Emmaus Road with him. They stopped. They reflected on what had been occurring, what it was currently occurring and they look forward. It's what happens on pilgrimage. Anna Rickert continues, the knowledge that results from this inquiry guides further practice. The model values experience as an important source of knowledge about teaching and the teacher as the holder of that experience, the valued knower. As we live our lives of faith, we have experiences too. We live in a culture that doesn't offer much opportunity, much space for telling about our experiences, our spiritual experiences. We need reflective practice. We can do it on our own. We can pray to God. We can journal our life stories. But it is so very helpful to do it in the community of other people of faith. This Jesus time and again came upon people in small groups, two, three, six, twelve, helped them talk their walk, helped them cultivate their sacred consciousness. As we tell our stories of grace, we actually are more aware of them. It, it augments our capacity for noticing grace. So we need this in theological education. We need this kind of thing in, in churches, in schools, opportunities for formation that rest in a narrative spirit, spirituality. The narratives of our life with God through prayer, the narratives of our tradition through scripture, the narratives of the lives of the saints, including you all, 
So I advocate a narrative spirituality. Narratology is a booming field in academia. And a narrative gerontologist named Gary Kenyon developed the concept of a wisdom environment. He defined a wisdom environment as any context or occasion, reminiscence, life review, or simply soulful conversation where deep storytelling is elicited by deep story listening, where narrative reflection is invited where wisdom as awareness of alternative stories is evoked. For those who, of us who follow Jesus, that wisdom environment is marked by prayer and community, where we can tell our stories, where we can listen, where we can hear alternative stories. Other people may have encounters with God that are different from our own. They may understand the scripture in a way that brings light onto it for us. So this lecture began with questions. It seems only right that I offer a few in ending. What tales of grace will you tell from this time of pandemic, economic challenge and social upheaval? In all the seasons of your lives and that of the world, how will you speak of the one in whom we live and move and have our being, even in the midst of it all, even in a culture that deprivileges religious conversation? And with whom will you share your stories and pray? Thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, uh, Susan. We really appreciate both the content of uh, what you have shared tonight and just your gentle, wise spirit in the very manner in which you've shared it as well. So thank you for a really rich time. Um, a few questions are, are starting to come in. And just as they do so, um, let me begin by just asking you to reflect a little on your title of all the titles that you could have uh, chosen, do you want to just tell us how you arrived at this particular expression, both the title and the subtitle, Talking Our Walk and Cultivating Sacred Consciousness? Um, could you just speak to your choice of that particular expression? Some scholars who've studied um, American churches have said that they don't adequately cultivate sacred consciousness and that the most effective uh, groups where there's accountability, creativity, and people find purpose, those groups do cultivate a sacred consciousness. So I'm drawing a bit on that. Nancy Ammerman is one of the sociologists who writes about that. Uh, talking our walk, um, not many people use that phrase, so it's not completely original with me. Um, for many years, I tended to teach ethics, which was all about uh, walking our talk. Mm -hmm. how, how do we live out what we say we believe? And more and more as a spiritual director, but also as a pilgrim, in, a, in metaphorical and geographical pilgrimages, I have discovered how important it is to talk our walk, that it shapes it, it forges community, and it, it enables us to understand our lives uh, within the sphere of God in a way that doesn't happen if we don't do it. That's great, thank you. Now we have a question from Stanley who uh, says, hi, I'd appreciate it if Susan can provide the title of the book she just quoted from, the one about the caring profession which she edited. Oh, it's The Crisis of Care, Affirming and Restoring Caring Practices in the Helping Professions. <laughs> and I edited it with Patricia Benner, 
And it has a chapter by Eugene Peterson that's wonderful. Um, Bob Bella, the sociologist, is in there. So is Charles Taylor, the philosopher. There's some amazing, amazing people in that book. And I asked uh, people in these different helping professions to contribute either a substantive, more academic chapter or a narrative from practice. So both are present in the book. It's, it's I, think, I think it's still worth reading. <laughs> No, oh, good to hear, no doubt. Now, you mentioned that you're finding that even during the pandemic that more people are seeking spiritual direction. And I wondered um, if you want to just elaborate any further on precisely what, what are they yearning for um, during this time in your experience? And then secondly, um, if you could reflect on the impact of meeting virtually you've done the spiritual direction for many years and i'm just wondering how do you find the process when you're now reduced to meeting people either online or by telephone uh, what impact does that have on the process of spiritual direction if any yeah great questions i've been uh, pondering them myself mm. so some of the people who've returned to spiritual direction are pastors who had kind of drifted away from working it, with me in spiritual direction, the lives very busy, very full. But pastors are trying to figure out how to serve God and their congregations during this very strange time. And so I'm seeing pastors. Some of the people I work with ordinarily um, are seeing it as an opportunity to have a little more space in their lives that they can reflect on this deeper level. They're not having to jump in the car and commute. Some people's work has been um, temporarily suspended. Some people are viewing it as a time to discern a new direction in their lives. Sometimes, for some, the new direction is being imposed on them because what they were doing is no longer possible. And for some, it just they're just using it as an opportunity to change a lot of things, and they want to make sure they're hearing from God while they're doing that. And so they come, they contact me about spiritual direction. I have for years worked with some people um, remotely because they're in different countries or different places. Some people have wanted to work with me by FaceTime or Zoom by a video platform. Mm -hmm. Most people remotely work by phone. The phone is actually a more intimate contemplative platform than the visual platform. They um, the technology of the visual platform has a lot of demands inherent in it that can be distracting from the interior gaze that happens with, with spiritual direction and can happen better on the phone. Hmm. There's just a lot of demand on the, and, and you have to see yourself. That's like the worst part of it. <laughs> yeah, true. <laughs> that, yeah, that's interesting. Now, in terms of continuing with the process of spiritual direction, you very helpfully outlined these various kinds of questions. You spoke of the what questions, the how, the why, and eventually the who. And I'm just wondering, as you're engaging with people in spiritual direction, do you notice is there any kind of pattern or sequence to these questions? Do they start with one kind of question and then lead to the other? Or is it just uh, different for every person? Or do you notice any kind of trends in your spiritual practice of direction? I think they weave in and out. Um, the why questions become very loud in times of suffering. Mm -hmm. Um, it's amazing how when some people start in spiritual direction, the who questions 
seem backgrounded or not expressed very often. But gradually over time working in spiritual direction, people speak much more freely about their prayer lives. But in most, most places, and even in church groups, most of us aren't very used to talking about that. Mm. So the who questions, I think a spiritual director always has in the foreground of their mind, but it can take a while for those to surface with a directee. Mm -hmm. And the what and the how, all these questions, when I teach people how to listen contemplatively, as I'm doing these two weeks at Regent, we do spend some time with all of those questions. Mm, wonderful. Well, here's an encouraging uh, contribution from Rosemary. She says, this is fabulous in content and presentation, exclamation mark. Is there room in her course which started today? Could I join double question mark? So uh, perhaps uh, Rosemary, we can get back to you from Regent. I'm not sure if there's still room to uh, join, but I'm not surprised that there would be that kind of interest after the public lecture tonight. Um, so. Let, we'll get, uh, we'll have Regent uh, respond to her question, but that was very encouraging to hear. Thank you, Rosemary. Susan, I wanted to ask you, you covered a lot of ground tonight, um, but one thing I didn't hear about that I wondered if you'd like to reflect on us, uh, um, on with us is the role of lament and grief during this pandemic. I'm thinking particularly uh, of so many people who have been suffering alone, particularly our seniors, and just the tragedy of so many people dying alone, removed from their families, removed from their loved ones. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have any, you mentioned having participated in a, in a few memorial services yourself, but I'm just wondering if you could reflect with us in terms of the role of lament and grief uh, in, this cultivation of sacred consciousness. Yes, absolutely. Um, and in a close community of spiritual friends, it's possible to express these things without having to justify them. So with people I listen to, they'll say, I just feel tremendous grief, and yet I don't feel like I have an excuse for that. You know, I still have my job, no one close to me has died. But there is a, a very large global lament, I think, that many people are feeling. And there is also grief around small losses, greeting, greeting the clerk in the grocery store, um, being able to hug a friend instead of standing six feet apart with masks on. So I think there is a real need for large scale lament and for churches to offer opportunities for that. My church did a beautiful lament service around uh, systemic racial injustice and um, provided the space for it, for people to really speak about it and feel it. The more we can offer these environments of honest uh, storytelling with a consciousness that God is present and wants to hear it all, the better off we are. You notice in scripture, like in the Psalms, people feel a lot more freedom to express strong emotion than most of us feel a lot more freedom to speak about God and to God than many of us feel. Mm -hmm. Very true. Well, I have two questions who ha that have come in from one of your friends at Regent, uh, from Mary Carroll. Let me give them to you one at a time. The first one asks, how would you say that an Ignatian group that you were a part of is different than say a church small group? Um, is it freer, safer because it's not a church group? 
well, they're church groups and they're church groups. <laughs> <laughs> and I would think some church groups might be similar. Mm. In the Ignatian exercises, people come together and they don't know each other. They do know they're all Christians. Um, and we work through a very um, clear itinerary during the exercises. So there are particular passages from scripture to pray with every day. And then we gather and meet once a week and reflect on what God has shown us through those particular scriptures. And the arc of the exercises is through, th it goes to Pentecost. So it goes through Jesus's life. Um, so unlike some church groups that are more free form, it has a very laid out structure that people have been following for 500 years. So there's also that sense that you're in a, <laughs> Uh, a historical and international community of other pilgrims who have walked this trail. I think the confidentiality is very helpful. The more confidentiality there is, the more freely people feel they can speak. Mm -hmm. And church groups have been notorious for not maintaining uh, confidentiality. In fact, I learned a few years ago that we get the word gossip from Middle English, from parish life. And it was a contraction of God's siblings. <laughs> so people in the church community, the same age, you maybe, maybe one kid's parents were, were, maybe they were godparents to each other's children. And so they became God's siblings and therefore gossiped. So people aren't going to speak as freely if there's that potential. But groups need to, to hold people accountable. I mean, a function of gossip is to hold a community accountable to certain expectations. So these small groups I'm, I'm in, the Ignatian exercises, and I'm in a few other confidential small groups, um, they do hold people accountable but it's, it's straightforwardly. It's not by telling the story about those people outside of the group. Yeah, good point. Well, speaking of accountability, that leads into um, Mary Carroll's next question. She says, accountability, purpose, creativity. Why aren't our church groups fostering these things? Does theology get in the way? Hmm. Wow, I hadn't thought about that. I should think theology should help with all of that, if it's good theology. <laughs> because theology means, right, the study of God, and God is, holds us accountable, gives us purpose, and fosters creativity. So it ought not to get in the way I'm, I'm not exactly sure why the religious organizations aren't at good at, as good at it. The this, this people I've been reading feel that church groups get too stuck in a certain kind of way of being. And therefore, there's not sufficient liveliness and honesty. Okay, thank you. Well, here's a question from Ruth. She says, do you have any thoughts about how we more intentionally offer privilege to sacred consciousness and transformation within the church and small groups? It seems that oftentimes small groups do not offer the opportunity to quote, talk the walk. How do you suggest churches go about changing that? Well, I think about some groups I know of in churches where the meetings begin with some kind of shared prayer practice. So at my church, I'm not part of it, but there's a Lexio Divina group that gathers once a week 
and they pray with a passage of scripture. They listen to it a few times and they pray with it. And then they share with each other what they feel God is showing them in that. So that is cultivating sacred consciousness. The people in the prayer are noticing God and in hearing, hearing other people speak, they're hearing how God is active in another person's life, in another person's soul. And there are some groups I know that when they begin, they do a prayer of examine where you just pray and reflect back on where you have noticed God in the past, say, 24 hours. And so the sharing begins out of the context of prayer. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you. Another question comes from Ki Hua, who says, thanks, Susan, for a very relevant and interesting lecture. Surprised to hear that the soulful community is happening more in secular organizations than in churches. Why do you think the church is losing this important role? And what can we as church members make a difference to restore the community? Important questions, questions I asked with you. Yes. The uh, sample that the Fetzer Institute researchers looked at were um, American millennials. So for some reason, they are not finding soulful community that really resonates with their souls in most churches. And we see a decline in churches in North America and less attendance among the young. So it seems like there's accuracy there. Perhaps the churches provide soulful community for older people. Um, but we ought to be offering it to younger people as well. I, I, do, I did mean it when I said, I think the pandemic may be offering us a golden opportunity where we will be doing church more in small group formats. Maybe church will be more like a honeycomb with different cells um, forming the whole. And there is more opportunity for storytelling and listening if a group is small. Mm. Some small churches are great at it. I've been to some very small churches where um, there is a time in the service for people to tell their stories or instead of just passing the piece, it's a longer time with, where two or three reflect on the scripture or on the sermon. So I think some churches have done that, but most churches you know, are a bit more performance spectator, performer spectator divided. Okay, thank you. And another question from Bethley, who asks, or who comments, thank you for a wonderful talk. You've presented a strong case for narrative spirituality. How would you apply this kind of spirituality in direction with people who may not see their lives as narratives, or who tend toward non-narrative understandings of their lives? Hmm. Well, I think I'm kind of always seeking the narrative. So if someone will, I mean, it is possible for someone to come in and kind of report, well, I did this or I did that. Or, and I will say, uh, tell me more about that. I'll try to elicit the story. Uh, the story and, and story and feelings are totally in, intertwined. The, the way memory works is a feeling is elicited <laughs> and that embeds that story in our memory. Um, so helping directees be in touch with what they're feeling. Um, I, I'm a spiritual director, so I will sometimes just forthrightly say, 
uh, what's it like when you pray about that? To elicit the story of their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. People will ask questions that I've learned to consider prayers. So like, what's God got to do with it? Or um, where is God in this? I think of that as a prayer. And, and I'm curious as a spiritual director to know what it's like to say that to God. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Susan, you've spoken about theory as embodied, storied travel, which sounded so appealing. And yet I couldn't help thinking this sounds like rather a far cry from our usual approach to theological education. So I'm wondering, how do you navigate or how do you uh, integrate this approach to formation while also holding key roles in formal theological institutions that often uh, have pedagogies that are quite different than this? Well, I've always been more in the spirituality domain of theological schools. So very interested in how people live out their faith, how they understand it, yes, but also how they live it. And, and I, I, th I think... Well, I haven't run into much trouble <laughs> so far because I've never, I've never claimed to be a theologian. I, I pretty much take it back to scripture. And I think scripture allows for this kind of understanding of our faith. That we come to God in prayer with all of our ability to comprehend, drawing on it's like on that road to Emmaus. Jesus came alongside them. He elicited their stories. He took an interest in them as people. He then told them about the Messiah, drawing on scripture, drawing on their communities of faith and what they've learned there. He takes an interest in their physical selves, in giving them food to eat. And, and then they go and tell their whole story. I think, I think really our fundamental theology that we receive from Jesus is embodied and storied. Yeah, that's very helpful. Thank you. And speaking of stories, I wonder if you'd allow me to contribute one because I couldn't help think when you were talking about pilgrimage um, and you were talking about sharing stories and you spoke about people speaking over meals or in gardens or as you're walking. And I wondered about another facet of that and that is um, story in action and story in silence. And what came to mind for me, one of the most powerful pilgrimage experiences I've ever had is a one week pilgrimage walk from the north of Scotland uh, up uh, over to Oban and then across the Isle of Mull to Iona just in time for Easter. We did it in spring and we got all seasons within the one week, I tell you. Um, and one of the strongest gifts of that whole pilgrimage experience is that of course in a group of about 20 adults you had all kinds of walking uh, capacities people had various strengths we had all ages with us and so they had a an actual wooden cross that would require four people to carry it and we carried that cross the whole way as a symbol of what this pilgrimage was about and I couldn't have foreseen what a tremendous equalizer that symbol became, that actual tangible symbol in our midst, because it meant that those who were the strongest um, and who would naturally go way ahead and leave the weaker walkers behind, they, they would need to, and as a discipline, they would return and come and take their turns uh, with the cross. 
in carrying that cross. And there was something just so tangible about literally carrying that cross together. And I remember we were going up a steep um, section at one point. I was exhausted. I happened to be on the back of the cross. It was muddy. It was sleeting. It was cold. I was feeling pretty miserable. And out of nowhere, another walker just came up beside me without a word, just reached out and took that cross from my hand and carried on in step and took that burden from me as we continued. So I just offer that um, by way of, you know, enlarging on um, the, the, the stories and the sharing of those that, uh, that you have contributed. Thanks and so you, Diane, you really bless us all with that. Oh, well, you that don't. evoked emotion in me. I'm going to remember your story. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, no, it's good to be able to reflect with you tonight. Um, and that leads me to another question, and that is, you spoke about reflective pra practice. And again, I want to ask you the very practical question as one who's been engaged in theological education for many years. I want to ask, how do you pursue this reflective practice as a discipline, just given the sheer demands both on faculty and on students. What do you say to those who would love to cultivate this practice uh, more diligently or more faithfully, but sometimes it's just hard given the demands of life? It is hard. It is very hard. And some of the most important things are soft. And they need to be boundaried and protected. So prayer, we can easily have that just evaporate in a whole list of demands that are hardwired. We can have time with people we love constricted and collapsed because of these hardwired things. So reflective practice too, we have to hold space for what really matters. And for instance, many people's early morning time is reflective practice on their discipleship with God. They read scripture, they pray, and they journal. And the journaling is reflective practice. But we also needed in small groups. I know Regent has offered small group spiritual direction. That allows for rep reflective practice on our lives as followers of Jesus. I've been on uh, church boards and other kinds of boards and committees where we start off the year with very good intentions to hold space for just this kind of thing. And then the really harder seeming agenda items can hijack it. But the few small communities of faculty and whatever trustees that I've been on that do better through even threatening seasons are the ones that hold the priority for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it is, it is not easy. Well, thanks. And Susan, I mentioned from the outset, as you know, I, I teach in the area of world Christianity. And so uh, perhaps my last question for this evening as we wind up our conversation is this. You cited the one scholar who was speaking about theological schools uh, increasingly living in a culture that deprivileges de -privileges religion. And his anticipation is that this would continue to be more and more the case. But I can't help asking, what do you make of um, two things? First, the enhanced interest in, if not formal religion, at least spirituality in the postmodern, post-Christian West. And secondly, I have to ask, what do you make of the tremendous shift in world Christianity to the global South? I believe you've had some experience in, in teaching and in, in spiritual direction um, in other contexts of the globe. And I'm just wondering, uh, do, do you see any differences in engaging with Christians in other parts of the world? 
Well, taking the second question first, um, I've been very ministered to by Christians. I have spoken to in other parts of the world because while I do experience the deep privileging of uh, my Christian identity in my own just social environment, I have never been persecuted for my faith. It has never been costly for me the way it is for them. And so I really learn from them. Mm. And my impression is that most of them within their churches have incredibly strong communities. They spend a lot more time together than I spend with the people in my church. They pray together, they, they have meals together, they help each other out through all kinds of crises, more so than I experience in my more urban commuter, large church, North American experience. And then the, you asked about the proliferation of postmodern interest in spirituality. Um, it is a pretty separated from religion kind of spirituality. Uh, I know some Buddhists, you know, North American, Berkeley Buddhists who, who are somewhat offended at the way their practices have been taken away from their religion. So the way uh, certain meditative practices, mindfulness meditation, have been stripped of the Buddhist religious history, um, worship, the whole context of Buddhism. And so I do think there is this hungering for something more, but um, I believe in the something more that's actually anchored. And religions try to anchor us in our relationship to God and our relationship to tradition and community. This other kind of spirituality may have good things in it, but it's not anchored in that substantive way. Well, that's really helpful, Susan. And this has been such a privilege just to join you in your reflections uh, this evening. We want to thank you so much for enlarging our hearts and, and opening our spirits for cultivating the very sacred consciousness that you're inviting us to this evening. So thank you very much and for all that you're giving in your course at Regent uh, this week as well. So thank you again so much, Dr. Phillips. Thank you to all of you in the audience. Thank you for joining us this evening. Good night.